This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, David Buss, who is a professor at University of Texas, Austin. David, I always forget whether you're you're in psychology, right, of course, but you're also in, in biology or uh, just uh, psychology? Yeah, just psychology, but um, I'm the head of the uh, Individual Differences in Evolutionary Psychology uh, wing of the department, area of the department. So, the interdisciplinary arm, right, of course. And, right, right. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, and we have we have close connections with some of the biologists uh, in integrated biology, like like Mike Ryan, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's going to be on. I'm have, uh, interviewing him later. Um, and you're also the author of a whole bunch of books that I've read over the years for more than 20 years: uh, Evolution of Desire, Dangerous Passion, Murderer Next Door, Why Women Have Sex, co-authored. And then, of course, this most recent book called uh, When Men Behave Badly, which I think kind of it draws on themes that were in all of those uh, previous books. And, and I think it's it's targeting uh, an audience that's interested in, you know, very contemporary things. And I think of all the evolutionary psychologists that I know, David, you are someone who is, you know, very, very much interested in uh, kind of applications of evolutionary psychology um, uh, for, you know, how we live now and, you know, how we organize society and how, you know, we, we think about, uh, contemporary interactions. And, and I imagine this also, you know, brings you to the attention of a, a lot of, uh, you know, non academic audiences, but, but, you know, what kind of, why is it that you're, you're, you're so interested in, you know, contemporary life and, you know, evolutionary biologists oftentimes spend a lot of time talking about primates and, and spend a lot of time talking about, you know, hunter gatherers and, and you talk about, you know, college kids and, and the workplace and so forth. Um, has that always been yeah. your, your interest? Well, well, um, well, no. So I, um, I guess early in my career, I fancied myself as a pure scientist who, um, scoffed at, you know, applications and, uh, uh, but, um, the more I got it. So, so this, my new book, uh, when men behave badly deals with conflict between the sexes. So that's that's the overarching uh, theme of the book, which of course is pervasive, um, goes back at least a billion years. Uh, and in the book, yeah, I do, I do talk about other primate species in some insect species, uh, different um, hunter-gatherer groups. Uh, but I guess what, what's happened is over time, and as, especially as I delve more deeply into conflict between the sexes, or sexual conflict, as it's called in biology, mm -hmm. um, I got more and more um, interested in applications uh, mm -hmm. of this work because why shouldn't? So, so there are real problems having to do with sexual violence, and and this these are these are the foci of the book, uh, such as um, deception and in internet dating, uh, uh, intimate partner violence, stalking, especially in the aftermath of a breakup sexual harassment in the workplace, sexual coercion, sexual assault by uh, friends, strangers, acquaintances in fraternities, et cetera. Uh, and the, these are, I mean, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, all these forms of sexual violence violate a, fun, a cardinal principle of what I call the first law of mating, which is female choice, stemming from Darwin's theory of sexual selection. Uh, that is females, and I think it should be a, a universal human right, right? So we, we talk about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of peaceable assembly. Uh, but I think freedom of sexual choice should be a universal human right. And what sexual violence, all these different forms of sexual violence do is they violate uh, freedom of sexual choice, uh, female, female choice in this case. Uh, and so... Uh, so my thought is, well, why shouldn't the science inform uh, what we can do to reduce these problems, uh, to reduce mm -hmm. sexual harassment, sexual coercion, rape rates, uh, intimate partner violence, stalking? And, uh, and, and if you look at the attempts at application, they are often not informed by the science of what we know about uh, human mating psychology, human sexual psychology. And so... I, I guess over time, I've become more and more interested in uh, using the work for beneficial effect in solving, in particular, sexual violence toward women. Right. And so the main focus of the book is really on 
kind of evolved uh, sex differences, right? And you know, when yes. I think of um, what I, when I think of um, the the sexes in, in evolutionary biology, I, I I'm drawn to this term, you know, frenemies, right? So we talk about frenemies uh-huh. in yeah. um, in in business strategy, uh, and you know, these there's there's um, situations where interests are aligned and situations where interests are, are in conflict, you know, within pretty much any relationship. Um, and the sexual relationship is, is no exception, but, but you also emphasize that it's, it's not, it, it really doesn't make sense to think about sexual conflict as kind of group conflict, right? So it doesn't make sense right. to think in terms of, you know, men as groups versus, you know, women as groups, but really these conflicts are, you know, at the kind of bilateral level for the most part. Yeah. At the individual level, that, that's right. And that's one of the, um, the errors that some people make in uh, some patriarchy theorists, for example, mm-hmm. make is they assume that men are somehow united in their interests in oppressing women as a group. Uh, and from an evolutionary perspective, of course, that can't occur uh, because uh, f- for starters, uh, men are in competition primarily with other men uh, and women are in competition primarily with other women. And so there's no unity of interests uh, between among males as a group and, and females as a group, uh, of course, there are there are sub exceptions to that. So males can form sub coalitions uh, within groups uh, or against rival groups, but those are typically formed again against rival male coalitions, not against mm-hmm. not not against women. Uh, so uh, so sexual conflict has to be understood at an individual level, um, where where what's optimal for from a male perspective and that male evolutionary perspective differs from what's optimal from a female perspective and so mm-hmm. there's uh what what biologists call sexually antagonistic coevolution which is very much analogous to predator and prey uh coevolution so where for each increment in the speed of a, mm-hmm. a predator that favors increments in speed and agility of prey and predators and prey are locked in these coevolutionary arms races uh, where where the the less fleet of foot get get eaten or or don't get their dinner and so starve to death, and uh, what sexually antagonistic coevolution is is it's a similar process. It's directly analogous. Where and in many ways disturbingly on point, where women are the prey and males are the predators, sexual predators. Um, but the uh, the coevolution means that there will be offenses and co-evolved defenses and counter offense and counter defenses. And these, um, these sexual conflicts have been going on for, since the origin of sexual reproduction itself, uh, as I said, uh, at least a billion years ago. So it's been going on for a long time. Um, so, uh, so we have to, and this is, this is the critical overarching theme of the book. And we have to understand how these sexual conflicts play out in different forms due to it, as you correctly uh, say, sex differences in evolved mating psychology and in evolved sexual psychology. And um, one of the things that has been a bit perplexing to me is that some of these sex differences have been very well documented for many years, in some cases, decades, but we're currently experiencing, and I hope it's a fringe of what I call sex difference denialism where somehow the males and females um, uh, are regarded as uh, identical clones of each other, uh, and, and they're not. Uh, it might make life easier if, if they were, uh, but, but they're not. Mm-hmm. And what evolutionary psychology does is it provides a very precise meta theory for where you expect to see sex differences and where you expect to see similarities. Namely, you expect to see sex differences only in domains in which the sexes have recurrently faced different adaptive challenges or different adaptive problems over human evolutionary history. Uh, you expect similarity in our, in our underlying psychology in all domains where we face similar adaptive problems. Uh, so one, one, just one quick example of that in a non-mating um, domain, but I think illustrates the point, is that men and women have similar taste preferences. They're not identical, but we both both sexes have uh, preferences for uh, fat and sugar, for example. Um, mm-hmm. But when do the taste preferences of men and women diverge? They diverge when women get pregnant. 
uh, and they face an adaptive problem that no man has ever faced ever, no male has ever faced, and 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 that is uh, they are feeding for two, but also have to avoid ingesting uh, substances that are teratogenic or, or dangerous to the fetus. So even things like broccoli, which are, are perfectly harmless for an adult female, uh, if they pl pass the placental barrier can be harmful to the fetus. And so all of a sudden when women get pregnant, they, you know, there's what's called morning sickness or uh, pregnancy sickness. They start finding certain foods very aversive. And it turns out the foods they find very aversive are foods that contain minute quantities of uh, toxins that, uh, or, or potential parasites that could be dangerous to the fetus. So, but the key point is that, um, is that it's only when the sexes face these different adaptive problems that we say, see sex differences emerge. Now, as it happens, because we are a sexually reproducing species and we differ fundamentally in our uh, anatomy or, and physiology, we expect psychological sex differences to accompany uh, the sex differences in anatomy and physiology. Again, and most of these fall heavily in the mating and sexual domain. Uh, the, the only exception to that is really not an exception. That's aggression, where, where males have a monopoly, at least on physical violent aggression. Uh, but that also turns out to be heavily mating related. If you look at the causes of when men get violently aggressive, they're all tributary to mating. Right. When we talk about these differences, um, I mean, they occur in both the domain of um, uh, understanding the world and also kind of motivations, right? So um, in, in the first case, when people are assessing the world and trying to understand it and estimate probabilities, uh, you, you highlight that there are some substantial differences uh, between, for instance, um, males tend to overestimate the extent to which uh, females might be interested in mating with them and, and, and females tend to um, uh, underestimate the, the extent to which males might be interested in mating with them. So, you know, preferences, uh, and, and I mean, when we're assessing the world, there, there's no evolutionary reason why we would necessarily evolve towards having the most objective uh, assessments, right? Um, right, right. If, if, if having no. an incorrect assessment, either being overconfident or underconfident is, is adaptive, then presumably, uh, you know, we will have this distorted view of the world. So could you, could you talk a bit about, you know, why males and females have kind of differential uh, uh, assessments of, you know, the world empirically? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, well, uh, the overarching uh, theoretical framework for this is um, what's called error management theory, mm -hmm. which uh, Marty Hazelton and I first uh, developed um, 21 years ago. And it's, and, and it's been applied to different areas of, of research, including audition and perception and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, but, but you're absolutely correct that, so, so here, here's uh, just to give one illustration. Let's say there's, um, you're walking through a wooded area and there's a rustling in the leaves. And there's some probability that it might be a dangerous poisonous snake uh, and some probability that it's just the wind rustling the leaves or, or a little rodent uh, that's uh, innocuous. So, well, um, uh, what would be your best strategy? Well, one strategy would be, uh, you know, if, if you err in one direction, that is thinking it's innocuous, uh, then you might die uh, by bitten, getting bitten by this poisonous snake. If you on the other hand, if you think, oh, this might be a poisonous snake, better avoid circumnavigate that area, uh, then, then you live to see another day. Now, statistically, if you are uh, incorrect uh, in the low-cost errors, that is, you think there's a snake when there really isn't, isn't 99 times out of 100, selection can still fa favor a perceptual or inferential bias to believing that there's a dangerous snake uh, when, in fact, there's not, because the cost of being wrong in that one instance can cost you your life. And so applied to, um, and so that's what we call error, man it's an error management bias. Uh, in applied to the sexual domain, uh, one of the primary constraints on male reproductive success historically has been sexual access to fertile females. And so um, 
uh, in inferring sexual interest when it's not there, what, one of the things that we find is this, we call it the male sexual overperception bias. Classic case, a woman smiles at a man or incidentally brushes up against his arm. He thinks, ah, she's, she wants me. She's interested. Um, when in fact she might be being just polite or friendly and so forth. And I mean, this is one of the issues that we grapple with fundamentally in, in social interaction is, um, we don't know with 100% certain certainty what the underlying internal states or intentions of other people are. We have to infer them. Uh, but males who um, over inferred would minimize uh, missing out sexual opportunities. And so, uh, and so what we uh, hypothesize is that the, this male sexual over perception bias is an adaptive bias. So it results in errors that is sexual approaches toward women who in fact are not interested and, and in the book, I talk about this being one of uh, about a half a dozen causes of sexual harassment in the workplace where some of these guys, uh, bosses literally think that the women want them when they don't. Um, but what we find is that men who pursue a short-term mating strategy dispositionally and men who are high on narcissism, personality trait of narcissism, that is, they think they're hot when they're not. These are the men most likely to make the sexual over to commit the sexual overperception bias, um, which which is precisely a, a design feature of short term mating strategies. We argue, um, uh, men who are pursuing a long term mating strategy much less likely to uh, commit that inferential bias. So, from women's perspective, and this is something we found in our lab, uh, is that uh, women underperceived. So we had men and women inter interact with each other and we asked them, you know, afterwards separated them, do you, th how interested are you sexually in this other person you just interacted with and how interested do you think they are in you? Uh, and what we found is that w women underperceived, and it, because it was kind of an unpredicted and startling finding, all we have at this point are speculations as to why women underperceive. And I think they're reasonable, but need to be tested. So, so one is that. Um, uh, you know, that women face a problem, which is unwanted sexual attention. And so one strategy of dealing with unwanted sexual attention is to literally not see it, not pick up on it. And so they may have this, uh, bias toward not picking up on, um, signals that, or that, that, that the man might be emitting, but, um, uh, but, but another might be that men who are interested sexually actively conceal their sexual interest early on in these interactions. Uh, because in fact, in other studies, we find that overtly sexual overtures backfire. That is, they are least likely to be successful. Um, uh, and so men, uh, may in fact intentionally conceal their sexual interest and give off long-term mating cues precisely as a strategy of obtaining short-term sexual access. So, but anyway, there's, so there are different hypotheses about why women, why we find women underperceive sexual interest from, uh, males, uh, and, and, but these remain to be tested. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember when I first, uh, learned, I remember learned about error management theory, uh, from you, I guess it was 20 years or so ago. And this is before I had, um, kind of learned data science and, and, you know, never didn't think in terms of confusion matrices. And, and now of course, this is something that I incorporate into pretty much everything that, that I teach. Right. Um, because when you're doing sort of classification, uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out what the optimal classifier is, you can't do so without understanding costs and benefits. And, and so, so people have a, uh, you know, evolved, understanding of what the costs and benefits are and this feeds into uh their assessment of the world you you talk about this in terms of uh the paradox of fear right with respect to crime and and how people tend to um have inaccurate assessments of the the risk of being um a victim of of sexual violence or uh experiencing uh viol you know serious injury during sexual violence um could you, could you delve into that and what are the implications of that as well? Sure. Um, well, this is, um, uh, you know, a very, it's a this fascinating feature or set of features of our, of our mating psychology. And that is that, uh, well, one, one is that women 
uh, fear rape and murder from strange males. So in our study, this is a, a separate study that Josh Duntley and I did of uh, what we called um, anti-homicidal fantasies, where we asked people, have you ever thought someone wanted to kill you? And one of the startling and unexpected findings was that a substantial number of women said, yes, I was walking down the street and this guy across the street was staring at me and it was, it was getting dark out. Uh, and I thought he was going to drag me into the woods and rape me and then kill me. And this was like, we had something like 75, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, an astonishing large, large number uh, uh, of these uh, rape slash murder, anti-homicidal uh, forms of ideation. And, and so, but when you look at the conditional probabilities of if rape, then murder, uh, based on all the evidence that we have, they're actually extremely low. I mean, one study put it at one in one in ten thousand. So why why would women have this um, fear of strange males, both for the rape slash murder, but also um, given the fact that most rapes are not committed by strangers, but are in fact are committed by people the women know, uh, dates, acquaintances, you know, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, and again, there are different hypotheses to explain this effect. So like one might be that there's a mismatch between ancestral and modern environments in that strange males may have in fact been the most, uh, likely to be rapists. So, uh, a small group warfare, which we know is often about women and capturing women, killing the men and capturing the women, um, uh, where, uh, whereas in the modern environment, uh, most rapes are acquaintance rapes, uh, or, or even spousal or boyfriend rapes. But another hypothesis is that, uh, women's fear of strange males actually could be very effective in avoiding and lowering the rates of stranger rape, uh, had women it, it not had this, um, fear of strange males. And so it may be very effective in the modern environment. And we know that women do engage in behavioral strategies to avoid strange males uh, and to solicit bodyguards when strange males are present and take other kinds of uh, tactical and evasive actions. Uh, so, so again, it's another example of what you were just mentioning where the perceptions of reality uh, might not be accurate in a in a statistical sense, but if you add the costs of being wrong mm -hmm. to the different types of errors, then it makes adaptive sense. Yeah. And I think you, you bring up this idea of, you know, the reasonable person, right? So, um, you know, if we're going to use a standard in law, which we call kind of the, the reasonable person standard, you know, what would yeah. be, what would, you know, would a reasonable person, uh, fear a particular situation, um, and men and women have, kind of radically different, um, subjective experiences, um, you, you know, reasonable men and reasonable women have radically different subjective experiences. Then, then does it, does it really make sense to apply this same standard to, to both potential victims? Yeah, I, I argue that it, that it doesn't. So, uh, in the case of a, uh, take it, take it, uh, use the example of sexual harassment. So there are, uh, a, as you know, um, very few laws are um, written to depend on the psychological state of the victim. So like, for example, mugging is a law. It doesn't matter what the psychological state of the mugging victim is. The mugging, it's the act, the crime itself, and that is the crime. But with things like uh, sexual harassment and <coughs> uh, stalking, it's another example, uh, they use the reasonable person. So would a reasonable person view this pattern of conduct to be sexually harassing, where in the case of stalking, it requires fear. Would a reasonable person uh, be afraid if they, they were exposed to this pattern of stalking behavior? Uh, and the problem is exactly what you mentioned, that reasonable men and reasonable women differ. In the case of sexual harassment, uh, women see exactly the same pattern of behavior as both more harassing and more upsetting uh, than men do. Uh, and so what happens is the example I use is a horrifying example of a, um, 
in my book uh, of a Texas politician who said, if, if a woman's going to be uh, raped, she might as well just lie back and enjoy it. Well, this is like, of course, there was some blowback a- about this, but this is such an astonishing failure of cross-sex mind reading where, um, y- you know, men underestimate the, the psychological impact of these, um, you know, abhorrent, you know, sexual forms of sexual violence on women. So, so with sexual harassment, um, given that the sexes differ, so w- what if the, the judge is a reasonable man versus a reasonable woman? Or what if the jury uh, consists of reasonable men and reasonable women? Well, how should we adjudicate this? And what, uh, and I'm not a, I'm not a law professor or a legal scholar. And so I don't know what the answer is, but I think that one could make a case that it, there should be a reasonable woman standard, given that women are um, far and away the most um, prevalent victims of sexual harassment and sexual coercion. And the more extreme the form of sexual coercion, the more heavily women are overrepresented as, as, as victims of it and males, the perpetrators of it. So, uh, so I think that this is, this is exactly one area where... Um, where knowledge, the scientific knowledge of sex differences can inform uh, policy to good effect. Uh, so, uh, so, so I think that, that that reasonable person standard needs to be questioned in these domains. Of course, there might be many domains in which reasonable men and reasonable women are perfectly in alignment, but not in the case of sexual harassment and stalking. So I want to get into this idea of, of mismatch. You know, um, a lot of the folks that I've spoken to mm-hmm. who have a background in evolutionary biology will, you know, highlight the extent to which the modern world differs from the environment of evolutionary adaptation. And, you know, this leads us to question some of the things that we we believe and, and that we feel. Um, and, you know, when we think about the modern college environment, we think about young people, you know, moving out of the yeah. household and, and being surrounded by strangers, or even if we think about kind of a large city environment, I mean, these are radically different from the small scale societies that we spent most of our evolutionary history in. And in those small scale societies, you know, we have, we have, we have allies, you know, we have, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, transparency, right, where people's behavior is, is being monitored pretty much, uh, 24 seven, um, you know, and then now we're thrust into this completely different environment. Uh, how well suited are we for this, this environment, right? When kind of kids go off to college or move to the city, (laughs) you know, are are we, are, are we in, are we in a good position to really understand how to, if, if our motives and our preferences evolved in that former world, then they're, they're going to probably not be great guides to our understanding and behavior in this more modern world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally, uh, resonate with your point. And I, in my, in my book, um, when men behave badly, I talk about a number of these sorts of mismatches and one is precisely the one that you allude to, which is, um, women, um, ancestrally were surrounded by close kin. Uh, you know, we evolved in small group living where, where you might have encountered, you know, perhaps a couple dozen potential mates in your entire lifespan. So then, you know, and, and so you take uh, young women surrounded by close kin who function as bodyguards and deterring sexual aggression. And in the modern environment, ship them off a thousand miles away to a college or university uh, where they have no kin around and, and they lose also their friendship network that they previously had in their, in their hometown. Uh, and so they, they, you, you strip them of their bodyguards and that makes them vulnerable, uh, to, to men who have very strong sexual motivations. And, uh, I mean, one of the things that we find, uh, not, not me specifically, but the, um, mm-hmm. uh, of who the victims are, freshman women seem to be wildly overrepresented a, 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 as victims of sexual assault, sexual coercion. Um, it's that first year where they're not they're not a, in, in this novel environment that they're not aware of, and then the rates go down with each successive year of um, of uh, college and university. So you have mismatches there. You have another mismatch, which is 
the ready availability of um, alcohol in highly concentrated forms that are relatively evolutionarily unprecedented. So there's actually a recent really cool book that, uh, that I recommend called Drunk by um, uh, Ted Slingerland. Um, and, uh, you know, he talks about the history of alcohol and, uh, you know, th there's some evidence that alcohol, uh, intentious cult, uh, intentional cultivation of alcohol goes back many thousands of years, but something like seven or nine or maybe 10 or 11, but it's, it's pretty recent, but the, the forms were very low. It's basically equivalent of beer and wine. So you don't get this uh, distillation of highly concentrated uh, things like vodka and gin or, or, you know, uh, which can be used to spike sugary drinks. You don't get that until much more recently. And so, uh, although we may in fact have adaptations to metabolize alcohol, or, or at least most, most people in the population do, we don't have adaptations to deal with it in high, these high quantities. And one of the things that we know mm -hmm. that alcohol does is it disables defenses. So it, um, uh, uh, physically, uh, you become uh, less adept in terms of musculature. Uh, and then also psychologically, your, your defenses are, are down your perceptions, uh, uh, your, your inferences about other people's motives and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, you become alcohol basically disables a lot of the def natural defenses that women have against sexual coercion. So that would be uh, another and then of course date rape drugs like rohypnol would be another example of that. So you have these. Uh, that's another mismatch. Is you have these evolutionarily unprecedented drugs which disable women's defenses. Uh, so, um, and then of course you have one other one other type of mismatch. And and I I alluded to this at the very beginning where ancestrally we would have ex been exposed to just maybe a few dozen potential mates in our lifespan. Now we have uh, thousands or millions in, in urban settings and in online dating formats. It really opens things up. And so this has led to uh, what some argue is the, the, the prevalence of the hookup culture on college campuses, where, um, uh, although I think there's another contributing factor to that, uh, which isn't just the prevalence of mates, but is a sex ratio imbalance. So one of the, one of the things, and I, I highlight this in the book as well, that when there's a surplus of women in the mating pool, uh, mating strategies tend to shift more towards short-term mating. Uh, and they do so because the rarer sex uh, is the more valuable sex. And so the rarer sex, uh, if I was, uh, as a concrete example, I was giving a talk at Texas Christian University, which is uh, not that far from where I am in, in, in Austin. And at Texas Christian University, they had a, uh, and I believe they still have something like 60% of the undergraduates are women, 40% yeah. men. Now, this is actually a huge sex ratio imbalance. And, uh, and basically what the, uh, what happens is these, um, the way one woman described it to me is that guys who are, who would normally be a five on the mating market are eights at Texas Christian university. And, and you talk to guys who went to TCU as an undergraduate. And they get this glazed look in their eyes as they fondly remember that there was this one time in their lives, this one era mm -hmm. where they experienced high mate value and unprecedented sexual access to, to women that they've never experienced subsequently. Uh, so, um, uh, so, and, and that's what you have now, and it's becoming more and more extreme. Um, and, and I think that, that, that it's women are being, are overrepresented among college undergraduates, to some degree, also depending on profession in in graduate school and other areas, the exceptions being things like engineering, uh, where may, there's still a male uh, prevalence in that. But like in the social sciences, um, you know, uh, you know, in the PhD program, like it, it tends to be like seventy percent women um, and and thirty percent men, and so. Um, so the sex ratio imbalances, I don't know how I got off on that. So you have to remind me of our <laughs> point of departure, but, but the sex ratio imbalances, I think, uh, creates another, uh, another mismatch. Um, 
So Although those, those we, kind we of sex know. ratios. So in, in small scale societies, what what kind of sex ratios do we see? I mean, there's clearly a higher mortality rate among males due to violence. Right, right. Um, that's that's that. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it depends on which society you're talking about. So yeah, yeah you go you go to the Yanomamo or Gabusi or any small scale society where there's uh, high levels of intergroup warfare then you're going to have higher male mortality, which mm -hmm. is going to produce a surplus of women, which is possibly why in many of those cultures you see a polygynous mating yeah. system. Right. So, I mean, with respect to this, this mismatch, I mean, aren't the boys also equally unprepared for this environment, right? Um, you know, the, the, the kinds of uh, mating opportunities, forcible mating opportunities that are available and, you know, to, uh, those who are violently inclined in cities and campuses. I mean, this is presumably something that was only um, available through warfare, uh, you know, at, and in small scale yeah. societies, right? Because, you know, in a highly closely monitored community, you know, th this, this sort of behavior would have been, uh, you know, unthinkable, right? Except in, yeah, in, yeah. in warfare. So, so they're, they're equally unprepared for this, this novel environment, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would. Uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, I don't. I don't delve into that in the book, but I would. I guess off the top of my head, say that um, they they still have the same mating and sexual motivations, and as you as you mentioned, the opportunities to conceal uh, these crimes uh, of of sexual violence are, are, are more numerous. So so an extreme example is uh, at fraternity parties. So go to a fraternity party, they spike the punch, um, and then they, uh, they, they have back rooms or basements where they take women. And so the sexual violence can be committed in, uh, in relative anonymity or where there, where there are no witnesses. Um, and I mean, this is something that sexual predators try to do is they try to um, not only disarm the female defenses, they try to divest them of their bodyguards, their friends, separate them from their friends or whatever other bodyguards might be around. Uh, so um, I guess the the other thing that I do talk about in the book a bit is uh, about males not being prepared is that is uh, another mismatch is pornography, uh, which has become widely available and widely consumed online. Uh, and Pornography, of course, is is highly unrealistic and uh, typically unrealistic and not representative of sexual interactions between most consenting adults. So in pornography, the typical thing is uh, male and female come into the same room and sex starts happening within seconds uh, of, of the encounter. Uh, no context, no emotional involvement, no, no psychological investment, um, basically total strangers. Uh, well, and, and that that of course uh, are uh, become uh, they're they're porn actors and actresses, and so they're sexual acrobats, and so so I think them you know I think this toys with our evolved male evolved psychology in a couple of ways. One is giving tr hijacking our sexual mechanisms into believing that there are dozens and dozens of uh, sexually willing women who require no in, no investment whatsoever uh and uh and then also if this uh the expectations of what they see in the pornography get translated into a real life interaction then women feel pressured to somehow live up to these um uh sexual acrobatics that the porn actresses engage in that um uh you know, uh, which just creates another form of sexual mm -hmm. conflict. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, the biggest mismatch seems to concern jealousy, right? So, you know, paternity uncertainty was something that, you know, we've had to live with uh, for, you oh. know, millions of years, right? <laughs> Regardless, you know, yeah. going back to our predecessors even. Um, but yeah. it seems in today's world, scientifically, right, this is, this is not an issue. I mean, there may be some um, kind of resource consequences of, of, of infidelity, but, um, but far less than there would have been in the past. Right. So, um, this is not something that presumably that you can easily change, right? This is so deeply rooted. Yeah. Um, the, the, the jealousy that even if there are <laughs> resource opportunities available to women that didn't exist before and 
pater- paternity certainty opportunities that, that exist that didn't exist before, it's it's going to be pretty difficult to eliminate jealousy and, and the violent consequences of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, that's why I titled that book that I wrote on jealousy, The Dangerous Passion, you know, because I think it's an emotion that is very difficult to quell. And um, I use this as a thought experiment which is like, you know, let, let's say that, I mean, one of the functions of jealousy is that it evolved to uh, preserve paternity uh, certainty uh, in the invest, in, on the part of the investing male. But let's say you go to a man and he's just gotten married. So he has his newlywed brush, blushing bride. And you say to him, like, like, look, your sexual jealousy evolved due to this paternity uncertainty problem. And it, it did well in solving that problem, but now it's irrelevant in the modern environment. Is it, your wife is taking birth control, um, you know, and in the off chance that she got pregnant, you could always do a DNA test. Um, so uh, you do this thought experiment. Now would, and then you say to the man, um, the, 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 the groom, you say, now, would you be comfortable with other men having sex with your wife right now? Now, now if you do that thought experiment, like how many men would say, oh, well, I realize that that ancient evolved function is no longer relevant. Yeah, please proceed. Uh, how many men would do that? Uh, so, uh, so I think it's, yeah, it's one of these things that's, um, uh, again, as you mentioned, it's a mismatch between ancestral and modern conditions. Now, one of the interesting domains in which this comes up is uh, polyamory. And there's a lot of talk about polyamory these days and and we don't know if there are more people engaging in this um life polyamorous lifestyle or whether it's just being talked about more and and less um uh out less in the shadows than it formerly was but one of the things that they grapple with is precisely that sexual jealousy that is it's a difficult uh you know it's like the monster figure in the polyamory world and so they develop different strategies of dealing with this and i know one one case one example of this polyamorous couple that i know uh it's husband and wife she's bisexual and so but they agree they can have sex with other people uh but interestingly uh he gets really upset when she has sex with other men and so he's always trying to pressure her don't have sex with other men just have sex with women uh where she says that uh, when I ask her, you know, do you get, if your husband has sex with another woman, does that bother you? And she says, no, not at all. But one time he, she saw him walking down the street hand in hand with a former girlfriend. Um, and that triggered her jealous rage, you know, so it was that, that emotional involvement or the intimacy that really tripped her jealousy, whereas the sexual aspects tripped his jealousy. And so, um, you know, now, now, of course, in the case of polyamory, you have these other, in, in the male sexual brain, you have these dueling uh, adaptations. One is sexual jealousy, but the other is desire for sexual variety. And so in polyamory, you males are trying to maximize their, or fulfill their desire for sexual variety, you know, and one of the prices they pay is that other men have sex with their with their partner. Now, of course, my guess is that and, and this is yet to be determined empirically, but those who gravitate toward the polyamorous lifestyle might uh, be those who are low in jealousy to start with or lower than average in jealousy to start with because there are these individual differences. Uh, and then also um, polyamory tends to be, although not exclusively, tends to be initiated by the male and the woman goes along with it because she doesn't want to lose the male. So sometimes there might be a mate value discrepancy where the, the guy says, look, this is, I'm a high mate value guy. I'm, I feel entitled to multiple partners. I, I love you and want to keep you and everything, but you have to engage in this lifestyle with me. So, um, so, so even, even in these, um, um, you know, you could say, I don't know how modern they are, but modern polyamorous lifestyles, you still see uh, our evolved sexual psychology and sex differences therein playing out. Mm-hmm. Now you quote a couple times in the book that I, I forget who, who, I mean, there's, there's no individual who said this, but it's a common theme among, um, evolutionary biologists that, you know, males were, were really, you know, created as part of a, a, a breeding experiment by, <laughs> by women, yeah. right. To, um, and, and, you know, this is, this is consistent with the female choice, uh, story, 
Um, but it has profound implications. So in most species, you have this kind of male uh, reproductive uh, skew. Um, and and this, this drives yeah. a lot of different things. Um, I know, I remember I saw this OkCupid okay data, which showed that um, when males are evaluating females, they tend to evaluate them along a uh, kind of a almost a normal curve centered around, you know, five out of 10. But when females are evaluating men, it's um, the, the average is like a three. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> only like 10, 10, 10% of the, the, the men yeah. in the database were considered above, above average. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's what are the implications? Yeah, it's actually 20. 20%, but it's the, the, the point is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the, that's one of the fascinating things and this is, um, it, it's not widely known, but I talk about this in, in my in my new book, uh, that on average, men find women to be more attractive than women find men, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and we know that a lot of mating historically that is over evolutionary time has been uh, hypergamous, that is women marrying, marrying up in SES and polygynous mating system allows that to, to, to some degree. Uh, and so, uh, and we know that women have evolved mate preferences for men who are high in status. And so, yeah, so you have in, uh, in these online dating formats, uh, women going after uh, the top 20% of the guys. Uh, and so then there are 80% of the guys who experience um, few or, or no mating opportunities. And uh, yeah, and, and, it, and this is a big problem because that top 20% of the males who receive all the female sexual attention uh, are typically unwilling to commit to a long-term mating relationship. Uh, and so, um, you know, and, and, and what would have been, I mean, in a polygynous mating system, uh, hypergamy, women marrying up, the man would have several wives, co-wives. Uh, and it would be all perfectly fine. But in the modern environment, we have a legally enforced monogamy. And so, uh, and so men cope with this, uh, by not getting married. And now, of course, uh, you know, I mean, these are, these are, these are generalizations, uh, for which there are large exceptions, but, but it is a, it is a fascinating, uh, finding that, that women just don't find men as attractive as men find them. Mm-hmm. But in, in a monogamous society, this is going to create quite a bit of tension, right? Where you have pair bonding, then there's there's going to be um, asymmetric dissatisfaction, right? So, you know, <laughs> right. you, you, you talk about, um, I mean, you, you have, oh. when you use these numbers, like eight out of 10, six out of 10, I mean, this is sort of a, a sortative mating, right? Um, where uh, presumably the, 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 the tens are supposed to match with the tens and twos are supposed to match with, with the twos. But, but in, in a world where, um, you know, the distributions are different then this kind of, uh, mate quality mismatch that you talk about, this seems to be something that that's unavoidable. There's, there's no way to get around it. And so it's going to create all sorts of tensions and problems. Yeah. Yeah. In, indeed. I mean, that's one of the, the themes that runs throughout my book is the, the problem of mate value discrepancies, because even if, a a couple is initially matched on mate value. So the eights, eights mate with the eights, mate value changes over time. It's not a static uh, entity. It changes with uh, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. You know, it can, it can go up, uh, you can gain status, you can uh, acquire mate value, or, or you can go down, um, you become injured uh, in ill health, uh, you know, uh, get fired from your job. This is something that we saw in the pandemic, by the way is a lot of people losing their jobs. And um, this is a, a, you know, given that women in part select men based on their resource acquisition abilities, a guy who, you know, women are very forgiving if the job loss is temporary, but a month after month after month, if it drags on, it creates sources of dissatisfaction. Um, and that may be one reason why we saw the rates of intimate partner violence spike during the pandemic estimates are they went up by about 20 percent uh possibly i mean it's not the on, only reason job loss isn't the only reason but but we know and daly and wilson were the first to highlight this is that men who who lack the benefits to provide a woman so uh, to stay in a relationship sometimes result to a cost infliction strategy of which intimate partner violence is one 
And that's why in the book, I devote a whole chapter to intimate partner violence and propose the disturbing hypothesis, uh, that it, it, it actually is functional. And I go into some depth about the underlying psychology, uh, uh, by which it, by which it works. Um, you know, for example, lowering the woman's perceived mate value so that she thinks she's very uh, lucky to be with the guy or cutting off her relations with her friends and her family. So she doesn't have those bodyguards there I engage in it, it's all diabolical in you know, the ways in which these violent men hijack women's psychology, but it works, you know, in the sense of statistically keeping women in relationships when it's not really in their best interest to be in those relationships. So some people would argue that the kind of decline of, of marriage as, as an institution uh, or a long lasting institution and the kind of delaying of the onset of marriage and, and the lengthening of this dating period combined with the, uh, you know, ease of, of, of dating through online dating. Some people argue that this is kind of, um, reintroducing more skew into the, the, the dating market than they had before. And, and this gives rise to, you know, these incels and, and I, I, I learned this term manosphere, which was, was in your book. <laughs> yeah. I'd never heard this before. So yeah. presumably there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of disgruntled, uh, kind of, uh, males out there. Um, that, that is this, is this something new? I mean, we, we see it in, you know, every society where there's, there's a gender skew or, you know, in societies where yeah. there's poly polygamy, um, is, is this something that is, you know, relative, I mean, you, you, you certainly had it in, you know, mining towns, right back in the, in the, uh, um, uh, well, actually, no, it wouldn't be in mining towns. It'd be the flip side, right? Mining towns are the opposite, right? right? So, right. They, they so, would have a sur surplus of men. It, it, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so what is this, is this, um, is this something, um, is this something new? This, this kind of incel slash manosphere movement, what is it? Does it reflect anything or is it, is it just a. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how, how new it is. Um, you know, in the sense that the reproductive skew that you mentioned, um, has been prevalent. We know this from the molecular genetic, uh, data that, uh, you know, the Genghis Khan effect where, mm -hmm. where, uh, something like 16 million men in and around the former Mongolian empire empire have the, um, uh, chromosomal signature of, of, one guy and probably Genghis Khan. And similar um, molecular genetic uh, sweeps have been found in other areas of like, uh, you know, with the Vikings and, and uh, Scandinavia, Ireland and, and the UK to some degree. Uh, so we know that this reproductive skew has been there, been around for a long time. With the incel, I don't know if that's just, um, you know, modern computer technology allows uh, people with similar plates to form groups, uh, and, 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 um, mobilize their efforts. Uh, so, so I don't know whether it's just a new name or, or a new phenomenon. I, I suspect it's, I suspect that it's an old phenomenon just simply because in every generation going back as far as we can tell there, uh, most of the females reproduce and a much smaller number of the males reproduce. So there's always been that reproductive skew at the incel. I can't remember if we define this for your viewers as uh, involuntarily celibate. Uh, and there was a classic uh, case of this out in, um, Isla Vista near Santa Barbara, Cal California, where this guy, uh, w was an incel and he left these, uh, uh journals behind. Uh, he said, he said, today is the day where I settle these disputes. Um, there, uh, since I hit puberty, uh, I've been sexually attracted to women, but they have absolutely no interest in me. And they, they sleep with these other guys, um, that they, they call them chads. Uh, and, and this, uh, in just infuriated him, uh, you know, year after year of being involuntarily celibate and went out and killed, I don't know, can't remember the details, but something like uh, shot 13 and killed six, uh, both males and females, because he was enraged at the males who got sexual access to the females. And he was enraged at the, at the women who denied him that sexual access. So in, in your book, you know, you talk about, um, intimate partner violence, you, you talk about, uh, rape and, 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 um, and, you know, I think in, 
these things are different. And um, historically, when you look at this idea of, of female choice, um, you know, it's hard to argue that, that females have had a whole lot of choice for, for most of, of, of our history, right? I mean, marital relationships were usually chosen by, by parents or by, you know, by the community. Uh, and oftentimes uh, people were married off, you know, almost at pubescence or prepubescence, you know, certainly all of the kings and queens of England and France and Spain, you know, they, they, they pretty much were engaged in these um, uh, games of thrones where they would be married <laughs> off yeah. by their parents for, for different um, dynastic purposes. Um, but the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't violence that was, that was involved. So, um, you know, to what extent when we talk about female choice, are, are we are we talking about uh, nonviolence, or are we talking about um, you know allowing people to express their preferences? Well, well, uh, uh, I guess the way, uh, well, a couple things. So, so one is that you, you're absolutely correct that uh, arranged marriages or, or marriages uh, made by the parents or kin were mm -hmm. far more prevalent, and they're still prevalent in some cultures. Uh, I mean, the most extreme one is the Tiwi tribe in Northern Australia, where the, the girls literally get married off at birth. As soon as they're born, they're promised to a future husband and they don't go live with them right away, but they, when they hit puberty, they do. Uh, and so obviously in those cases, there would be no female choice. However, even in cultures where there's a, a arranged marriage, women often exercise choice. So that is they. They might marry someone who their parents arranged for them to marry, but have sex with someone that they really want to have sex with. Uh, they might elope with a, 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 what, a man they love rather than the one their parents arrange. They try to manipulate or influence their parents in their choices. So, um, and parents often don't want their son or daughter to be miserable uh, in marriage. And so there are, even in, even in arranged marriage cultures, there's some latitude, veering, of course, some latitude for fe female choice. But I think this is part of the um, co-evolutionary arms race, or one of the co-evolutionary arms races is that is that there's always this tension between women wanting to preserve female choice and men and other interested parties wanting to circumvent that. And so if we get back to this idea of the, the, the breeding experiment where, for where females yeah. are. By the, by the way, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story about that. You mentioned that you interviewed Sarah Hurdy is yeah because uh, I emailed her because I first heard that from her. Uh, and so I emailed her as, as I was quoting it in the book, and I wanted to make sure that I got my source correct. And she said, in fact, it wasn't her, but rather uh, her mentor, who was Irv DeVore at, at mm -hmm. Harvard, who used to say that in those words are similar sorts of words. And so, uh, so she attributes that quote to, to, to Irv DeVore, but, uh, but, but has used it. And I, and I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of truth to it, mm -hmm. Wh which is fascinating when you think about it, that, that men are one long breeding experiment run by women, which means that a, a lot of the bad stuff we have, a lot of the nasty stuff we have is in some sense, a product of female choice. And, I, I, in what probably, what might be a, a very controversial part of my book is, uh, is I make the argument that the creation of uh, what's called patriarchy is in part due to precisely that. Mm -hmm. That is, if one component of what's called patriarchy, although it's one of these words that has a million different, de different definitions, is male control of resources. So, but if it is the case, and we know this is, that women prefer to mate with males with resources and they dump males who don't have resources. And you see this, by the way, in modern rap lyrics, if you listen carefully to modern, like uh, Kanye West and, and Jamie Foxx's gold there. Uh, but so women prefer to mate and have sex with guys with resources. So over time, this has created motivational mechanisms, uh, motivational adaptations in men to claw their way up the status hierarchy mm -hmm. to gain access to the resources that make them attractive to women. And, and, and men, we know that men are more monomaniacal about doing this. I mean, they're willing to sell their grandmother, you know, sacrifice their family life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever, to claw their way up these uh, status hierarchies. 
and men have not placed an analogous selection pressure on women in their in their mate selections. Uh, and so um, and so the fact that men can, can in the modern in most modern environments do control the resources is in part due to female mate preferences. Uh, and so and so now you could say now so not only do males control the resources, now you're blaming women for yeah. the fact that they do. But of course, it's not a matter of blame, but it's a matter of identifying um, the co-evolution of female preferences and male strategies of, of mate attraction. And I think that that, that uh, account has to be part of the causal picture. It's not the complete account, but it has to be part of the causal picture. Yeah, I, I, I was, the reason why I'm concerned is that, you know, this idea of preference, it seems rather... Um, I don't know, anthropomorphic, right? Uh, you know, when we say, for instance, that a female spider, you know, prefers X or a female horse prefers X. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you study biology, then you start to question, you know, this idea of human preferences. Um, because if we look at sexual selection, right, if the idea is, well, I want to select someone who is going to give me more grandchildren, if if violence is a successful strategy in, in some way, and and uh, having a violent mate means I'm going to have you know violent uh, sons who will be successful. Then doesn't this throw into a bit of confusion this whole idea of, of preference, right? In other words, I prefer someone who uh, coerces me into doing something I don't want to do, right? I mean, well, that doesn't well, really make sense. Well, well, I, I don't know. I, I see I see your point, but I would I would I would push back a bit on your on the initial claims. So I think it's very um, easy to demonstrate uh, uh, in non-human species that different sexually reproducing species do have preferences. And, uh, and biologists use that term all, all, all the time. So like the bowerbirds, for example, mm -hmm. females, you know, ha have a choice and different males can, you know, construct these different bowers with different you know, elements in them and, and visual, uh, attractive visual objects. Females go in, they inspect one, they inspect another, and then they, they make choice. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's not anthropomorphic to call that female choice or female preference, uh, in this case, operationalized behaviorally. So, uh, so, so I don't have a problem with that. And, and I don't think most biologists do who study non-human species do. But your, your other point about about violence is, uh, is I think, um, uh, I don't even I don't even know quite how to phrase this, but but that it is the case that males who um, who overcome female resistance adaptation. So females have part of preference is resistance. So preference for some males, but also resistance to other males. That is, they they don't want to mate with that you know eighty the eighty percent of the the incels. But uh, it is the case that males who are able to overcome that resistance, that female resistance, will be more sexually successful. And the overcoming the female resistance could be due to um, uh, honest courtship providing benefits. Mm -hmm. It could be due to deception. Uh, uh, it could be due to uh, force. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you know, this raises the issue that I talk about in some length in the book of whether, uh, very controversially, whether men have rape adaptations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I end up arguing that they don't, um, uh, although it, it, it's a hot, it's a reason, it's not an unreasonable hypothesis that they might. Uh, the, and, and I go into different arguments about that and examine some um, specific uh, rape adaptation hypothesis. So the one one example is uh, what's called the mate deprivation hypothesis, where the idea is that men who can't attract women through normal means of courtship and attraction or or deception and seduction, um, they resort to uh, a violent strategy of of force, uh, of rape, of sexual assault. Uh, so uh, so the mate deprivation hypothesis, but but actual tests of the mate deprivation hypothesis show that it doesn't really work. So it is the case that among convicted rapists, they do tend to come from lower socioeconomic groups. But I think that, that that's, um, that's a bias. Uh, and so you have, I mean, the modern phenomena, modern uh, 
names that have splashed in the news over the last couple of years, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Jeffrey Epstein, these are not, um, you know, loser males in, in the sense of that these are males who are powerful, who have resources, uh, aplenty, uh, but they they were able to get away with their sexual assaults in part because, uh, well, in the case, in, in some cases like Bill Cosby, in the case of, uh, evolutionary model, mo uh, modern drugs that disabled the defenses of the females, but, but also in part because they had the resources to, uh, force their, some of their victims into, um, financial settlements or non-disclosure agreements, or were able to hire high priced lawyers, um, uh, that most men can't even afford, but who enable them to get away with the being basically serial sexual predators. Um, and, and there's also experimental evidence that men who are more like in college, men who are more sexually successful, uh, uh, are more likely to result to coercion, uh, and force or threat of force as a, as a strategy, not, not typically the first, um, mm -hmm. strategy, but, uh, but a strategy. And so there's actually a, a fair amount of evidence against the mate deprivation hypothesis, which is, which is one of the ones that had, that has been, um, um, advanced, uh, it's not an unreasonable hypothesis. And of course there are some mate deprived men who do resort to, to rape, but, but as a general hypothesis, that doesn't seem to be supported. So from an evolutionary perspective, the, the question is, um, are there specific rape adaptations in males? And what I argue is that rape, uh, is that the answer is no, there's, there's no evidence that there are specific rape adaptations in males, but that rape cannot be understood without understanding, uh, a multiple features of male evolved sexual psychology, you know, starting with, uh, sexual attention, attentional adhesion to attractive women, uh, a reward circuit in the nucleus accumbens of our brains that give men a sense of pleasure when, a, when watching attractive women, the male sexual overperception bias, desire for sexual variety, which we know is more powerful in males than in females. And the male, um, proclivity to use force in a variety of contexts to, uh, mm -hmm. to get what they want to achieve their goals, whether it be robbing someone of their money, uh, or, or sexually assaulting someone. So, but these, but that, but that use of aggression, it's not a rape specific adaptation. It's, it's a strategy that males use in a variety of contexts. So. So I think that, uh, so, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's, that's what I, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but, uh, or raises more questions than it an, uh, answers, but. No, it, uh, it certainly adds complexity to it. Um, and so you've spent a lot of your time fighting the naturalistic fallacy, right? Uh, I mean, it, yeah. it seems that you spend an enormous amount of time trying to convince the reader that talking about instincts, talking about proclivities and propensities, talking about the evolutionary rationale or the functionality of, of different um, psychological characteristics does, does not imply that these things are in some way desirable. And, and it, it seems like, you know, beating a dead horse, but I guess you can never do it too much, right? Why do you think there, there is this, this sort of naturalistic fallacy that you have to continually fight against? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. And and I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's so pervasive and so prevalent that I almost think that somehow our brains are wired to um, think that way. Um, but um, I mean, one example I use in the book to kind of illustrate why it's not correct uh, is if let's say you're a cancer researcher, no one mm -hmm. says, well, you're a cancer researcher uh, and we've identified some natural causes of cancer. Therefore, we're, we're in favor of cancer and want to promote it and spread it. I mean, it would be absurd, right? But, but somehow when you get to humans and you get to, especially some of the um, nastier elements of human nature, people do make that, uh, commit that fallacy. And uh, part of what I, yeah, I do go to great lengths in the book to try to dispel it as I've had in some of my other publications, but I think it's especially important to dispel it uh, for this topic. Uh, of sexual conflict and sexual violence against women, 
um, and um, and part of the uh, part of the way is, one way in which I try to do this is to to illustrate that in fact um, we have adaptations that can counter it. So, for example, we have adaptations for status and reputation, and for maintaining our status and reputation. Uh, and uh, for guarding against um, slips and slides and cat catastrophic falls from from positions of uh, power and status, and so uh, these can be leveraged uh, to do things like reduce rates of sexual violence, uh, and and so uh, norms change, laws change, uh, and people are responsive to these. And so the fact is that even things like, um, I mean, Pinker. Pinker wrote a whole book on that called The Better Angels of Our Nature, in which he uh, argued that that different forms of violence uh, have, in fact, declined over different time intervals. And I know there's a controversy about that, but it is the case that th that um, things like marital rape, um, it, laws against marital rape are, are only about 30 years old or so. Uh, and so you have now lo laws against something that was a crime that was uh, committed very frequently, but there were no laws against it. Mm -hmm. Same with stalking. Stalking laws, I think, came in in the early 1990s. Pe men could stalk women with impunity without suffering any consequences at all. And so I think that things like um, laws and uh, social norms can be changed and that we have evolved proclivities to be responsive to costs and benefits and social reputation. Uh, so, uh, so just because something is evolved doesn't mean we have to, um, indulge, indulge it just as, as, a, a, a concrete example as one that you, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with, but, um, is, uh, eating preferences we have evolved preferences for fat and sugar, but let's say we also have evolved preferences, uh, to stay healthy or to get physically fit. And so we can sometimes say, uh, override our taste preferences and not eat, you know, uh, a, a quart of ice cream or a tray of brownies because we have a, another, a, a goal that suggests we want to inhibit those proclivities. And so, so evolved does not mean inevitable. Involved, evolved does not mean morally good, um, you know, et cetera. So avoid the naturalistic fallacy. Well, and I think this was the most optimistic message of your book. Uh, towards the end, you know, you talk about it. well, maybe we can change this this breeding experiment, right? Change the rules <laughs> of the of the breeding experiment and uh, alter, you know, the the rules of of status acquisition, um, and you know, uh, f figure out a way to shape our societal preferences so that the the characteristics of the of the most desirable men are, are ones that are. Uh, as far away from this dark triad that you talk about as, as, as possible. Um, yeah. Do you think this is a, a realistic possibility? How, how plastic are these preferences? Can, can we, can we, can we change them in a generation? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think not, not in the generation. So um, as, as you know, evolution is a slow process. And so um, <laughs> although it's, uh, it's, it, change can occur a lot more rapidly than most people thought. So you can get changes in a few generations um, uh, of, of thresholds for engaging in the behavior. But I think that a, a more effective strategy in the short term will be not to try to change preferences, because I'm not even sure how you would go about doing that, um, but rather to change their expression and behavior. So, um, so just as... Uh, you know, men, uh, so for example, I think it would be very difficult. Well, it, 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 it's an open question. So take the male sexual overperception bias. Okay. Can educating men and women about the fact that men tend to over infer sexual interest when it's not there, can that alter, um, uh, men's sexual overperception bias? Will they commit fewer errors of inference? when they are educated about that bias. And I think that, that it's possible that they might. Um, so, uh, although, although maybe difficult. So I'll give you one, one, one anecdote about that, um, which I probably shouldn't reveal, but I'll, but I'll review. This is a long, long time ago, uh, when I was a much younger professor, but I was, uh, giving a lecture 
in an undergraduate class, I was talking about the sexual overperception bias and a woman in the class, as I was talking about it, it was like her eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger. She was like, she lit up like a light bulb. And so uh, it turned out after class, she stayed after class to want to and, and talk to me. And she said that this was the, the reason that uh, she uh, and her boyfriend broke up. Uh, and, and the reason was she, this was a woman, she was attractive. She was very friendly. She was like dispositionally smiley. Uh, and so they would go to, she and her boyfriend would go to parties or go out to a bar and guys would just be constantly bombarding her, hitting up on her because they were inferring that she was interested because she was mm -hmm. friendly and smiling and so forth. So, so, so here I was, I just lectured on the sexual overperception bias and she tells me this story and I think she's coming on to me. So, <laughs> so it was very difficult even for me to, uh, you know, override it. Now, of course, then, you know, I realize afterwards, though, that's like totally absurd. Uh, but, uh, but, but so I think it's an open question how much you can change these things. I think one generation is not going to be enough, but what you can do is you can change things like laws and social norms and, um, and you can educate men and women about these sex differences. I think that's one of the biggest problems is that people use their own psychology, in this case, their own sexual psychology to infer the sexual psychology of the other sex. Mm -hmm. And, and we're kind of stuck in the interiors of our own mind. Uh, and if we use our own psychology to make those inferences, they're going to be off. So, but educating people about, well, we know scientifically that there are these fundamental sex differences in our sexual psychology. I think that education offers an optimistic opportunity for ameliorating some of these um, more um, darker angels of our na nature. Uh, well, St Steve Pinger calls them better angels of our nature. Uh, I, I, and we want to suppress the darker demons of our nature. Mm -hmm. Right. And you also mentioned that when it comes to uh, education, uh, educating people as to how to protect themselves, educating women about how to protect themselves is something yes. that, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from, uh, uh, for fear that it, it, you know, might mislead. We, we need to, uh, you know, give women the power to, uh, protect themselves and to understand, you know, the threats and where they might come from. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, I mean, I devote a whole chapter to women's defenses. Uh, precisely for that purpose, uh, which goes through about a dozen or so defenses against sexual coercion and also talks about uh, they, uh, the scientific evidence that we have about which ones are effective and which ones are not. So, um, so I think, uh, so I hope people read that chapter of the book, especially, I think that's, that's absolutely critical. David, I enjoyed the book. It's, uh, it really does build on a lot of the previous work. Uh, if you like this book, I highly encourage you to go back and, and check out uh, some of the other books. Evolution of Desire, of course, is, is a classic. It's, it's been around, I guess, 25, 25 years, 20 years now. Yeah. Um, also, Dangerous Passion, all about jealousy. Um, it's not a, not a how-to. It's a, it's, a, it's a really, uh, you know, great book. Um, and The Murder Next Door, which is, you know, uh, which is really delves deeply into those demons of our our worst nature. Uh, thank you so much, David. I appreciate you joining me. Well, thank you, Greg. It's been great chatting with you and great catching up after all these years. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.